Anyway, Peter and his wife and I had dinner on Saturday night and commented on what a bittersweet dinner it was. Yeah. I mean, it was nice to get together with them because they were old law friends. Mm -hmm. Bitter because Bernard wasn't there yeah. because he's tending to look up his son. Yeah. And um, anyway, the, the whole ceremony was fun. Mm -hmm. They did a really good job at the National Academy. They gave out, I don't know, maybe 20 awards. Uh -huh. And I was amazed at the diversity of the awards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one went to a, a naval architect who designs boats. Oh, I thought that was really yeah. good. Uh, one is a guy you may know, and his name is Al Alasakos, who's at Berkeley, yeah. who's a nanoparticle chemist. Oh, and um, and there was an award for the LICO project, and bunch of physicists who reconfirmed Einstein's theory. Oh, uh, yeah, that's cool. I mean, it was just nebulous. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and a woman who is the president of the academy, mm -hmm. her name is uh, Marcia McGuire. Um, she's a former editor of science. Mm -hmm. and Bernard likes her, Peter doesn't, and all I did was watch her. She's a closed hand, right? Okay. And, 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 Peter was sitting behind her the other day, and here she was on her iPad looking at dresses. <laughs> and here she is up on the stage during the award ceremony, and she fell asleep. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess she's done it so many times. Hi, Mike. Oh, I am. Yeah. Hey. Good. How are you? Good. I'm sending vanity. Mm -hmm. All right. Which one are <laughs> So. It was going to be clear. So, where was it? Where was it? It was at the National Academy building in Washington. Oh, okay. Which is constituted on uh, 42nd Street. Right on the mall. Sure. Beautiful building. Um, then, <clears throat> there was a very nice reception afterwards. And mm -hmm. I saw a friend of mine from Hopkins, mm -hmm. Diane Griffith, you know, made an event. And, uh, and she's, anyway, she, she's on council for the academy. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we walked back, well, we walked bus back together. Mm -hmm. We sat in the bar and just had bar food for dinner. Perfect. <laughs> but I saw a lot of old friends, Mike Goldstone, uh, mm -hmm. Scripps, Matt mm -hmm. who used to be here. <laughs> Kind of small world, Storms between uh -huh. Birmingham and Atlanta correctly. Yeah. And <coughs> I did. Nice. <laughs> I succeeded. I wonder um, how the interstate and stuff are coming along. The doctor coming out. I think, I think we're fine yeah. on I 20 yeah. at the hotel, but I, uh, I think the people who uh, uh, are going to be driving from the north and have a hands off. I thought it was something on I-20 the other but I guess it's There was, but they fixed the house. They got to fix it in 24 hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good as usual on that. That's the big problem, right? On um, 85. 85, yeah. 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 
I said to Mary White that Mike wants to call him. Yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. And we want to say you want to see your people so they hear their yeah, it's it That's fine, Doug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and hi, she said. So he could probably be there. I, I want it today because it's just one of the people And I said, well, if you have to, be, I can yeah, direct you. Yeah. And you only want to do Thursday. I would say the same thing. Yeah, yeah especially if, if these calls are productive, mm -hmm. in your opinion, then we may only need Thursday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, as you say, they were going to start back in some aims already, actually. So. And circulate them. I said, well, that gives you bullet points. But yeah. it's so much more easier to react to that than vague ideas. And I think they're around on target. Oh, I love the others. They group works really well together. Yeah. 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 So really yeah. 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 It's really pleasing yeah. for this screen. Yeah. Yeah. Even Jane Nelson can't get on the phone all the time. Mm -hmm. it's sort of like bouncing yeah. around. Yeah. yeah. I'm out of the way. It's terrific. Yeah, and then that makes smart. People have done it. He's got it. Everybody's got it. And I think everybody trusts one another. Even my son, you know, it's just he's great. He's got like 28 clubs out. So, yeah, I'll have that. You know? I don't know how much of a time. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get going in the remaining eight seconds before it's 12 noon. Thank you all of you for coming. Um, for those of you that haven't grabbed lunch yet, there's lunch in the back. But please sign in in the sign-in sheet if you haven't done it yet. Do it on your way out. My usual reminder. <laughs> so, and uh, we only have one uh, week left, actually. Next week is our last um, iteration of the series. But today we have um, a special treat because Rich hasn't spoken in probably two years or so. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was time to bring him back on the schedule uh, to talk about clinical trials and how the clinical trials really fit in the drug development scheme. We always kind of gloss over like there's phase one, two, and three, and then magically you get to the FDA and they approve your drug. Well, there's a little, bit, a little bit more to it than that. So I'm really pleased that Rich agreed to talk. Uh, so he's been also the brainchild behind the Alabama Drug Discovery Alliance. It's the PI on this big antiviral grant that we have, U19. So he's well versed in all kinds of aspects of uh, clinical trials. I think today's probably going to talk about CMV yeah, well, quite a bit, about, yeah. all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. And um, enjoy. And for those of you that are online, if you have a question, put it in the chat box. And at the end of the lecture, I'll double check in the chat box if there's any questions. Good. Super. So I want to keep this as informal as possible. So if you have questions, stop me and interrupt me. And um, we'll talk through some of these issues. And I think Micah said it very nicely a minute ago, and that is when you think of a clinical trial, you say, okay, you know, we're going to do a clinical trial because we want to get a drug licensed at the end of the day. But that's not necessarily the only purpose of clinical trials. And I want to leave you with that point today, because when we do clinical trials, we want to learn about the disease process. And in learning about the disease process, we want to build in biomarkers it will predict the success or failure of an intervention. And that becomes incredibly important as we look to the next generation of drugs that we want to bring online. So, you know, if you were to say, how many drugs go into clinical trials that ultimately lead to licensure? It's no more than one out of 20. And a lot of drugs are cast off as we go down this road. So let's walk through it and um, we'll see what we can learn. And uh, yeah, we'll just do it this way. So anyway, the bottom line on it is um, I want to talk about many faces of clinical research. I guess maybe this doesn't work, but you can see here. Maybe I can use a pointer. Yeah, I can do it. Many faces of clinical research. And only one component is the appraisal of a drug. And we talk about three different kinds of trials. And you'll read about them when you see licensure of drugs. Um, that are being evaluated. One is a placebo-controlled study. And if you go to the agency and say, whoa, hello, <laughs> you 
If you go to the agency and say, what is your preference for doing a clinical trial? The answer is placebo control. But guess what? If you have a drug that's licensed, and now that they've walked in, you know, if you have a drug that's licensed for HIV infection, you can't do another placebo controlled study. So you've got to do drug comparisons. And that's what we call a head-to-head -head comparison, or you can even do open label evaluations. But the agency doesn't like doing open label evaluations for the licensure of drugs. There's one exception, and that's rabies. And if you have a drug that cures rabies, you don't have to do any controls whatsoever. So, um, and I'm not sure that they might say the same thing for some of the diseases that we worry about today that are life-threatening. And I'll give you another example, and it would be Ebola. And you have to come, become very creative in terms of designing approaches to the evaluation of medications in those uh, circumstances. Don't forget, clinical studies are also done to understand the natural history of a disease, uh, and that becomes very important if you want to do fundamental translational research. The evaluation of a diagnostic, guess what? You know, you've got to evaluate a diagnostic with as much rigor as you do a drug for uh, licensure. Uh, for example, we're doing a study now that's called the Genmark uh, herpes study, where we're taking pregnant women and we're basically doing PCRs in the delivery suite and we're comparing the PCR data uh, with the data that we generate by culture so that we know the sensitivity and specificity of the assay. And then you can certainly look at the assessment of an inter intervention. Uh, and a good example would be a drug eluding stent. So, okay, who are the sponsors? And this becomes very important for you because if you're on the outside in academic medicine and you pick up the New England Journal of Medicine or you pick up the Journal of the American Medical Association and you see a drug study that's published there, you want to know who sponsored the study and whether there's potential bias in the study. And I want to come back to that in a minute when we talk about conflicts of interest. So for industry, the goal is very different than what it is for eggheads like me or Micah or Ed. And that is, you know, industry wants to license the intervention because they want to make money, right? And if we're on the wrong side of the fence of that and we're being paid to do a study, then it introduces potential bias. I'll come back to that. <coughs> An academic institution can sponsor a study, and the goal would be to generate new knowledge, and that's not unimportant for sure. Add value to the intervention, and I'm going to give you an example of that, and establish proof of principle. So one of the things that is a lot of fun is the Alabama Drug Discovery Alliance that MICA manages, and um, we want to generate new knowledge through the institution and two institutions because it's UAB and Southern Research. But what we want to do is take a molecule and get it into people so that it has enough value that the cost to the pharmaceutical industry or even a partnership with industry goes up. Proof of principle is really, really important. And then an individual can sponsor a study. And the goal, again, is to uh, establish proof of principle and the value. And, and for those of us who are in academic medicine, it's also to advance a career. Uh, that's not to be underestimated because today in academic medicine, and even here, doing a clinical trial may involve 10 or 15 people. And if you want tenure, you'd say, well, my name's buried on a paper with 10 or 15 other people. Our dean has established team science as a basis for getting promoted, and we need to keep that in mind. Okay. So what are the components of a clinical trial? And this is true whether you're doing a drug study for industry or whether you're doing it sponsored by an academic institution. So first of all, what is the hypothesis that you want to test? And, and there are a couple pharmaceutical firms who approach the clinical trials for drug licensure the same way we would approach a clinical trial to develop knowledge to better understand the disease process. So you begin with the literature search. And then you define exactly what you want the outcome to be. Will outcome A exceed outcome B, and by what percentage? And you'd usually like that margin to be 25% to 50%. Then it's unequivocal. If it's 2%, you'd say, huh, what's that about? Uh, if it's 5%, you'd say, what's that about? Because that could overlap with the standard error for doing the clinical trial. <clears throat> we also do non-inferiority studies. 
And that simply means if you're doing a head-to-head -head comparison between two medications, you want to make sure the variability in the outcome is no greater than 10%. The industry would like to say 15%. There are people who are consultants for the FDA who say 5%. And I think what people have sort of compromised on today is about 10% variability. And you can certainly kill a drug if you exceed that 10% variability. And then the, the last question you have to ask is, is it ethical? And what I mean by that is if you've got a licensed medication in the community, you can, as I mentioned a minute ago, do a placebo-controlled study or use an inferior licensed medication from the community as the comparator for your study. So, for example, if I was studying uh, a new drug for herpes simplex virus <clears throat> and I had the option of using acyclovir or valacyclovir as a comparator, I would use valacyclovir because it's superior to acyclovir, comparing it with the helicase primase inhibitor, for example. So once you know the hypothesis, once you know the literature, then you have to translate that to endpoints. And you have primary, secondary, toxicity endpoints, and exploratory endpoints. When you, you're doing a licensure study, toxicity is always a critical issue because the agency wants enough exposure to medication to know that the intervention is safe or know what the limitations of the intervention are. And we've seen that time and time again. You know, you'll use the Data Safety and Monitoring Board to look at toxicity and to make sure there are no changes in drugs that have become licensed in the community. <coughs> but the bottom line on it is toxicity is really, really important. Primary and secondary endpoints will define efficacy. And exploratory endpoints are what I find fun because exploratory endpoints are like identification of biomarkers identification of parameters that you want to use in the future to help define where you want to go. Okay, so what are the first steps? Team of people sits down in a room, and that team of people is a multidisciplinary team of people. You've got people who are trial managers, you've got regulatory people, you've got biostatisticians, and hopefully you have a clinician who understands the disease. We see clinicians who approach this process, and they are clueless about the disease. They just were offered a drug to study, and you know what I'm thinking about. They were offered a drug to study, to, for example, to ex expand uh, blood volume, and they don't understand what they're doing at all. That doesn't work. They don't have the right to do a clinical trial. They shouldn't have the right to do a clinical trial, but they do. Okay, so data, ma data management plan, where will the data go? That's not insignificant. Remember, data from clinical trials involve patients. Patient confidentiality is of prime importance. So the data have to be safeguarded where whatever you do with it, whether you keep it on a computer, that computer has to be safeguarded. Um, if you keep it in the cloud, the cloud has to be safeguarded. If you have case record forms, the case record forms better be locked up. Okay, how is the data verified? You can't just say, well, you know, we're gonna collect data and then not verify it. So you have to actually monitor the clinical trial and at the time you're developing the data management plan, you've got to develop the data monitoring plan as well. I'll give you a classic example. Study was done with um, a vaccine in Eastern Europe. And when the data were put into the computer, the data were identical on every single solitary patient. Did that raise a degree of alarm when people began to say, well, what happened here? It sure did. And all those data had to be disqualified, and an explanation had to be filed with the agency as to why the data were uh, eliminated. And you had to analyze those data separately to show that they were different from the database that was submitted. <clears throat> How it's protected is really critical to the agency. It's critical to this institution. You've seen people get fired at the, at the uh, VA here because they happen to lose their laptop computer with data from 2,000 patients on it. That doesn't go over well with the people at the IRB here. So what about the biostatistical design? Sample size <clears throat> is critical. How's the randomization going to be done? Who will prepare the data safety and monitoring board reports? And who will be on the data safety and monitoring board? What are the credentials of those individuals? Do they understand the disease? I'll give you another example. We're doing a study here in patients who have recurrent glioblastoma multiforme. 
and we're using a genetically engineered herpes simplex virus that we're putting directly into the brain tissue. And then we're monitoring for toxicity. Well, there's a data safety and monitoring board that reviews the data on each patient after they go on the clinical trial. Nobody from UAB can be on that data safety and monitoring board because it's a conflict of interest. So the person who chairs the data safety and monitoring board happens to be an expert on herpes encephalitis, which is the one toxicity that you would worry about, and he reviews the data as it comes in. And then you have to have an analysis plan. And all this has to be done prior to the initiation of the study, even prior to submitting the protocol to the FDA for what we call an IND, which you're all familiar with, is an investigational new drug application. <clears throat> what happens behind the scenes? Okay, there's a statistical review. So the statisticians are going to read the protocol from start to finish, and they're going to make sure they're in agreement with the plans that have been laid forth. We've got to design case record forms. And I don't mean that they have to be hard copy. They can be electronic case record forms. That's fine. But you just have to have a case record form that will meet the standards of the agency and that the agency believes. If you use remote data entry or if you use electronic case record forms, you have to define with the agency how the data are going to be monitored and who's going to do the monitor. Now, I'll go one step further. If you're going to fax data to a central unit, it then goes automatically into a database. And you could do that today. You've got to verify that the fax machine works. <clears throat> and you've got to verify, not once, you've got to do it on a monthly basis. And you've got to have a log that you've monitored that the fax machine works. How do you do that? You create a mock uh, case record form, enter it peripherally from University Hospital, make sure it got tr transmitted into the database. And then you need review board approval. So you have an IRB. You all know what the IRB is. You've talked about that. Fortunately, we have a joint UAB and Southern Research IRB that works well. For <clears throat> academic studies, we use one of our IRBs. For drug company studies, it's the Western IRB, which is a commercial IRB, which is noted here. Then there's the conflict of interest review board, and that's not insignificant. It goes back to what I was saying before. If I'm taking money from a company and I'm doing a study for a company, that's a conflict of interest. I mean, I can't do that. That's absolutely out of the question. <clears throat> on the other hand, and I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I'm on the board of a company that's publicly traded. I get compensated by them. <clears throat> Our conflict of interest review board knows that. The money I get from it, I use to endow a chair in my parents' name, so it's not like I'm putting it in my pocket. But I have to make sure that I don't talk about that company's products that I don't write prescriptions that re reflect the medications made by that company or give talks that reflect that company's work. Otherwise, I'm in conflict. So how does the CIRP document what I do? <clears throat> if I'm teaching in an infectious diseases board review course, they want to see the conflict of interest slide. And they want to know what I declare every talk that I give so that they can monitor my behavior and they know that I'm in compliance with their standards. You know what? I'm fine with that. There are a lot of people at a lot of institutions who aren't fine with that because they want to conceal what they're doing from the outside world. But as far as I'm concerned, transparency is the only, only way to be. Then if you have a gene therapy intervention, you've got to have a gene therapy review board. Here it's, it's our comprehensive cancer center. It's built into the, the uh, comprehensive cancer center. <coughs> One of the things that um, one of our colleagues, Penny Jester, and I pushed for and we succeeded in accomplishing was a universal IRB. And that is if you're doing the same study at 15 or 20 or 40 different institutions, why does it, every institution have to file its own uh, IRB form? Why can't you do it with a universal IRB? And in fact, we pushed that through the uh, NIH, through NIAID. And it was funny because as soon as NIAID did it, then the NCI did it, and all the children's cooperative group studies and even some of the adult studies are done through a universal IRB. And, and in those circumstances, it's 200 institutions and not a few. And then we have to write an investigator's brochure. And you'd say, well, what's an investigator's brochure? It details all the work that led up to the clinical trial, all the in vitro evidence that the intervention was going to work, the in vitro proof of principle data, the animal model data, the preclinical animal toxicology data, and then what we call the ADEM data, the absorption, distribution, elimination, and metabolism. 
so that it's laid out for every investigator and every IRB. And it also serves as a document that a nurse coordinator can refer to to make sure she understands the status of the preclinical work when she's talking to a patient. We update investigator brochures regularly. Some of our studies take 10 years. And when they take 10 years, that's an outrageously long period of time. Uh, but that's the way life is. You know, things change in that period of time and you want to put new information in there. So what's the protocol? And this is true whether it's an industry-sponsored study, an investigator-sponsored study, or a study that comes from uh, an individual within the institution, and we call that investigator-initiated studies. There's a background and significance section. There's an approach to the problem section, relevant data, cell and animal experiments, what I just mentioned, ADEM, uh, endpoints, <clears throat> inclusion and exclusion criteria. For example, pregnant women are off limits in most circumstances, except for the study I just defined because it wasn't an intervention. It's just getting a vaginal swab and looking for evidence of HSV DNA, and it might help her at the end uh, protect her baby. So there are inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria. Uh, there are details of evaluation, where, when, what, and how. So we set up flow charts, all the vital signs that will be monitored, all the blood draws that will be monitored, all of the white cell processing that will be done, all of the PK studies that will go to someone like Ed's laboratory. Sample size determination, including statistical methodology, how adverse event monitoring is going to be done, and that's at several different levels. It's adverse events, it's serious adverse events, and really serious life-threatening adverse events that have to be reported to the FDA immediately. Literature cited, and then the appendices that include the case record forms. Um, and it usually is associated with the investigator's brochure. Okay, let's look in a little bit more detail at um, the IRB. <clears throat> You know consists not only of UAB people, but also people from the lay community. And you know the informed consent has to be written in the language that can be understood by a high school student. Guess what? People like me can't do that. I mean, I can't write an informed consent at the level of, you know, my grandchild. So, understandable to a teenager, yeah, you need help from people who are really good at writing informed consent. So, understand who those people are. Fortunately, the CTSA has a couple of people who are superb at it, one of whom is Penny Jester. Mm -hmm. You know, and she knows how to do that with a team of people that she has. It's got to be accurate and it's got to be without bias. You can't push somebody to do something by saying, this intervention is going to help you. And I, I guess the thing that I've learned the most is I'm on the NIH recombinant DNA advisory committee. And whether I like it or not, I'm now the chair of it. But there have been a couple of ethicists on the committee over the years and they have always made the point that when you're looking at a new uh, intervention that represents gene therapy in cancer, you can't say that this may benefit you. All you can say is, you are a volunteer in this study, and we thank you for your participation. You know, now, is that incentive enough for an individual to participate? Well, you know, when they're running out of options, it probably is. <clears throat> You've got to evaluate, evaluate the mechanism by which consent is obtained. And sometimes um, they even require videos of consents being obtained because they want to make sure there's equipoise and they want to make sure there's no conflict of interest. What is equipoise? Equipoise means that the field is level. There's no bias that's presented. <clears throat> and normally what you do, if it's not... It also suggests that there is a, an uncertainty. Oh, yeah. That... Yeah, there is an uncertainty. There's an uncertainty about what the outcome might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There has to be that degree of uncertainty about what the outcome might be. Um, and you've got to make sure you identify what the potential adverse events are and who's going to pay for the adverse event if you encounter it, because that's not insignificant today, too. Medical help will be available to assist you, but it will be at your expense. Usually that's the phraseology that's used in many of these studies. Certainly, if the study is sponsored by the government, the government's not going to pay for the care of patients if there's an adverse event. <clears throat> there's particular interest <clears throat> in marginalized study populations. You know, so children, you've got to make sure that there's a potential benefit for children. Women, as I mentioned before, because they're sacred and underrepresented minorities. <laughs> they are. <laughs> okay. 
Conflict of interest review, goal to ensure that all parties have no vested interest in the outcome of the study, whether it's financial or non-monetary gifts in kind. Let me use a good example. Um, well, and this includes family members of investigators, and it also means ghost writing, which is verboten today. So for example, if I do a clinical study with a pharmaceutical company like Merck, I've got to write the data up. I can't let Merck write the data up because it would be a conflict of interest. And then a question that I want everybody in the room to realize is, does the institution have a conflict of interest? People forget that. But I'll give you an example. Jim Marker, Yancey Gillespie, and I have a patent to use a virus that expresses IL-12 in the treatment of glioblastoma multiforme. UAB owns the patent, right? So UAB's got a conflict of interest. The three of us have a conflict of interest. Our departments have a conflict of interest. So how do we get around that? How are we able to do the studies here and yet um, obtain data that will allow us to advance our work and hopefully this virus? The answer is real simple. Vanderbilt's our institutional review board. Vanderbilt's our conflict of interest review board. There is an investigator in the Department of Neurosurgery who's been given what we call a safe island so that her departmental chair, who's on the patent, can't in any way do her harm or abuse her because the study doesn't go well. And uh, UAB is aware of the conflict of interest as well. So we just have to manage it rather than deny it. Federal approvals, is an IND required? Well, if we're doing a study within the state of Alabama, and that's the state of origin, doesn't cross state lines, you don't need an IND. So, I mean, somebody at St. Vincent's Hospital or at Brookwood could do a clinical trial with an investigator-initiated program. They don't need an IND. I theoretically could do that at UAB, but I can assure you the folks in the administration building wouldn't let me do that. They wouldn't let me touch a patient with one of our interventions from the ADDA unless we filed an IND and it met all the federal standards. Uh, if it's NDA directed, it's got to be new drug application directed. You have to have an IND. No two ways about it. And I've seen so many companies take shortcuts. For example, they want to get a new drug application, but they want to get the drug into people fast. And they don't necessarily want to file an IND in the United States, so they take it to the Southern Hemisphere, or they take it to Eastern Europe, where the ethical lines that people follow are a lot less rigorous than they are in the United States. And if you see a company do that, just turn your back and walk away from them, because that's not the right thing to do. Registration of federally funded clinical trials is mandatory. So you see clinicaltrials.gov, and that's good, and that's bad. It's good from the standpoint that everybody knows a clinical trial is being done. It's bad from the standpoint because the details of the clinical trial are there. So for example, I'm studying suppressive therapy of neonatal herpes, and I'm putting babies on six months of a cyclovir given orally versus a placebo. There's no other standard of care in this clinical trial. That was on clintrials.gov. Accrual was horrible because you go around the country and everybody was using acyclovir according to our protocol, even though there was no data to support its use, right? So that's the good part and that's the bad part. Compliance requires adherence to the Code of Federal Regulations. The CFR defines what we can do and what we can't do, and that's part of the monitoring uh, that will be done by everyone who is involved in a clinical study. Funding can come from the government, can come from industry, foundation or philanthropy, can come from the institution, and here it can come from the Health Service Foundation if the trial is thought to be important or it can come from a department, and that's happened with several departments, medicine, neurosurgery, surgery. They funded several of their own studies. Um, I've also seen studies funded by private foundations, and there are investigators here who have money from foundations, as well as philanthropy supporting a clinical trial as well. Okay, now this is really what uh, Michael was alluding to earlier. You know, we talk about phases of clinical trial development, and everybody talks about a phase one study, phase two study, phase three study. Folks speak very little about phase zero studies, except for Ed, and folks be even less about phase four studies. And for phase zero studies, this is incredibly important. There are clinical trials that are designed to expedite clinical evaluation of new molecular entities. And so it's an exploratory IND, 
It supports the performance of first in human testing of a new investigational agent at subtherapeutic doses based on reduced manufacturer, manufacturing and toxicology requirements, including drug target effects, PK and PD. And it's to give an investigator or a company some sense as to the approach is gonna be reasonable, even knowing that you don't have the PK and PD data that you would from a classic phase one or phase one B study. Um, and you're seeing this done more and more frequently. And if it's being done by the pharmaceutical industry, they're going to do it through a contract house. They're not going to do it through an academic institution. Most of the time you hear about phase one studies. And that's to define distribution of potential effects of the intervention. So we talk about PK and toxicity in normal volunteers. And it begins with single dose, single day, then multi-dose, single day, multi-dose, multi-day. Um, and it entails sequential blood draws, collection of select biologic fluids. So not only do you get blood, you get urine. In some circumstances, you get spinal fluid. If you're looking for penetration of blood-brain barrier, um, sometimes you'll get saliva. A lot of times you get white blood cells because you want to look at drug concentration. Phase 1B is PKPD and toxicity in patients who actually have the disease. So there's a drug that has been developed through the ADDA for myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, it's in the hands of the National Cancer Institute now. They have finished the phase 1A part of the study, and they don't have patients with myelodysplastic disease. So we're going to get it back at UAB sometime in the future, whatever that may be. And we'll be able to do the PKPD here, and we'll get specimens for our cancer pharmacokinetics, pharmacology laboratory, so we can get a better understanding of the distribution. Why is that important? This is a drug that came from an academic institution, developed with NCI, and it's coming back to the academic institution. So it's bench to bedside, back to the bench, back to the bedside. So it's the classic loop that you hear about, but very rarely see in academic uh, medicine, and never in industry. So I'm gonna give you an example, and boy, does this look familiar? <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example of some of the crazy things that we've done. And I want you to keep in mind that when you do a clinical trial, the dictum that you want to live by is keep it simple, stupid. And David Kimberlin and I thought we knew what we were doing. And we designed a study to look at an intervention for congenital cytomegalovirus infection that involved giving an IV drug, namely gancyclovir, followed by the, um, the orally bioavailable um, derivative of gancyclovir, known as valgancyclovir, for a couple of days. Then we gave more IV drug, and then we did more PO, and then we gave more IV drug, right? A lot of blood draws. You can see PK was being done on one, two, three, four, five occasions. We decided we needed to simplify this, so we did, and we simplified it to the point where we gave a dose, we did the PK, we gave IV for a couple more days, and then we um, identified the correct dose to use orally so we could get rid of IV therapy, which is really a problem when you're talking about babies who are less than a month of age, and you're going to keep an IV in for six weeks. That's not a pleasing thing to tell a parent at all. And so here are the scatter plot data, and actually these were generated by Ed, who's in the back of the room. GAN cyclovir concentration, post dose. Um, and this is the plasma levels, um, again, in post-dose. Um, this is, on the left, is oral valgan cyclovir, and on the right, it's gan cyclovir administration. But I think one of the things that we learned that was really, really, really important is you think you know what you're doing, but you don't know what you're doing until you get the data. And here are the data. This is the median gancyclovir concentrations in the blood following IV dosing at days day four and 34, right? So here's day four, and then look at day 34. You can see that the peak plasma level is significantly lower, but even more importantly, if you look at the area under the curve, it's significantly lower. So the question is why? Well, the more we figured it out, median gancyclovir concentrations following oral dosing, day 6, 35, and 36. So when we look at the day 36 data, when we adjust the dose, we can repeat the day 6 dosing so we get basically the same area under the curve. Well, what's it about? It's all about renal clearance. So as renal clearance matures, 
you excrete drug to a greater extent, requiring that we adjust the dosage of medication according to the age of the child. And this is a beautiful correlation. This is, I think this is one of the prettiest pieces of data that's come from the Collaborative Antiviral Study Group. And there's just another illustration of it. Now, along the way, remember, I mentioned exploratory endpoints. Well, exploratory endpoints can mean... Is that... Uh, pardon me for interrupting. No, is you that, um, In other uh, pharmacotherapies in this age group, is adjustment for renal clearance over time something that's part of routine care? Ed would say and yes. Other, other, other indications. Yeah, what's, what are other good examples, Ed? Um, <clears throat> all of the antiretroviral drugs we use uh, domestically and internationally uh, in babies, whether they're uh, preterm, for example, versus term versus several months of age. Alcetamivir is a really good example. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, active metabolite, alcetamivir carboxylate, is renally eliminated. Uh, after it's formed, and big, big differences in uh, little babies versus older children. Um, so any any drug really that has a significant renal uh, component, whether it's the parent drug or an active metabolite, when you get down to that age range, it's it gets very, very tricky uh, trying to figure out what, what the right dose should be. So, you know, I think, again, cyclovir data paved the way for people understanding that to a larger extent when we built it into the oseltamivir studies. And a lot of the antiretrovirals weren't even evaluated in little kids when these data were published. So it was really evaluating. Yeah. I mean, it's really, really important. Um, so so the, yeah. and I guess in ret my question also, in retrospect, hey, should you have thought about that at that time? Do you think back and think we should, or was it not known? Or? Wasn't known. It just wasn't known. Wasn't known. Wasn't known. Mm -hmm. but, but even if it is known, I mean, we can guess that that's going to happen, but you have to get the data mm -hmm. to see you know, what it actually looks like. What we've gone to now, sorry, Rich, but very quickly, is uh, modeling and simulation uh, uh, techniques where we can more accurately predict what the exposures might be. Can I use another example? You know, Ed and our colleague David Kimberlin, Micah's colleague as well, and I tried to convince one company predicated on Ed's modeling how to study a very specific drug for herpes simplex infections of the newborn brain. And no matter how hard we tried, they paid no attention to us. They didn't get it. And they didn't get it. And here we are, what, seven years later, and they still don't have a drug on the market. Mm -hmm. And we could have helped them get it done and get it done efficiently. But I... I'm sorry. The, it's we're, okay. We're down it's a rabbit hole here, but the thing that would that would be curious to me would be: Can you go back to your regression? Yeah. So if you one more. Oh, age. So if you plotted the, I would be interested in knowing the regression of the change in the clearance within an individual, and the change in the individual's level. So you, in other words, you might. Mm -hmm. You might see an even tighter correlation if you if you adjusted for the inner individual variability in clearances. So maybe when someone comes in in 20 days, you measure their clearance again in that individual. That's what tells you the dose, not the. I think that's where we'd like to go: personalized medicine. And we've done that on a few patients that we've taken care of that we put on long-term suppressive therapy, and we did. We get levels, and we correlate it with renal clearance now. We're, we are not doing <clears throat> studies in little babies right now with this particular drug. Uh, we, we may end up doing that with uh, asymptomatic CMV babies where we are going to do random uh, levels and look at renal function. Because some of those children will be premature. <clears throat> and we are doing PK studies in the micropremia with the parent co compound because we don't know how to use it at all. But it, just to get back to your question real quick, there's also a very, very strong correlation between age and weight. And so yeah. a lot of the drugs are going to be weight-based dosing um, in you know, milligram per kilo or weight bands, however it's done. And so that actually captures a lot of what you're, what you're talking about. Because with the change in age comes a change in weight, comes a change in clearance. Um, and that relationship as reflected in, in this correlation is built into the dosing calculation. I said.
It's complicated. It's, well, but, but yeah, you know, and the problem is, is that it's easy for an academic egghead like me to work with Ed, who's an academic egghead, and we can go to clinic and we can pull bloods and we can do the things that we want to do to take care of our patients. <clears throat> we can make recommendations to the physicians in the community, but they forget to adjust according to the weight of the child. And we had one child who had recurrent herpes encephalitis because the pediatrician didn't adjust the dosage of suppressive medication. And fortunately, the child's okay. But Okay, so I was talking about exploratory endpoints. This is whole blood viral load for CMV in this study. And what we wanted to do was correlate viral load in the blood with outcome and see how it changed over time. Um, and what we learned, actually, when we did it was uh, we couldn't find a direct association. And you would presume on the top of your head that viral load in the blood would correlate with outcome. It didn't. And we just verified that with a beautiful study that um, a physician from Bologna, Italy, just wrote the manuscript that we're going to send in shortly, where we looked at viral load every which way to see how it correlated with outcome and we could find no association. Phase two. Okay, goal. <clears throat> Phase 2A is performed in the target population, proof of principle, usually three doses of medication, 120 to 160 patients per cell. Um, it gives you confidence that your intervention is working. <clears throat> Phase 2B is again performed in the target population, and it has an expanded sample size to guarantee proof of principle. And you usually go from up to about 250 per cell, maybe even 300 per cell. Depending upon medical need, the FDA will, under rare occasions, allow phase two data to stand for licensure. Very, very rare circumstances, but they do. If the, the unmet medical need is great, they'll uh, try and fast track the drug and allow things to get done. So here's one of the experiments we did. And um, we wanted to see whether or not we could effectively treat congenital cytomegalovirus infection, the most common congenital infection in the United States today. It's about, we used to say 1% of all live-borns, but it's probably now down about 0.8% of all live-borns. Informed consent, gancyclovir versus no treatment for 42 days. There's the dose we used. We monitored clinically and virologically, serologically. We looked for toxicity. We had escape clauses. Whoops, sorry about that. We had escape clauses for uh, hematologic renal liver toxicity and clinical decline. And then we did follow-up at 6, 12, 24, 36, 48, and 60 months, up to five years of age. Okay, what were the endpoints? The primary endpoint was improved brainstem evoked responses by one gradation. We looked at it biologically, which is the total number of years, or functionally, the best year. If you have one year, it will dominate, so that was an acceptable endpoint. The FDA even bought that. And then <laughs> we looked at, although the FDA dealing with this study was crazy, they wanted us to do another placebo control study. We weren't going to do that. Laboratory improvement by two weeks and clinical improvement. So what did we learn? Okay, this is change in hearing between birth and six months. Green is good, red is bad. So you can see that the gancyclovir recipients did well. They had improved or unchanged hearing. And uh, no treatment group, 41% of them had deterioration in their hearing. And it was greater than 36 decibels, and the p-value was less than 0 0.01. What about one year of age? Okay, so we only, <laughs> we only treated them for six weeks. Now we're looking at them for one year, and we can see that about a fifth of them had deterioration in their hearing and again, cyclovir recipients. And in the no treatment group, it's now up to 68%. So... That's about what we would expect to see in this group. What about a phase three study? The goal is registration, controlled and randomized, monitored by a DSMB. That last study was monitored by a DSMB as well, usually 900 to 1,000 patients per arm. And that's not a lot of patients. You'll find it, for example, with the rotavirus vaccine that was associated with susception. Susan Ellenberg, who was the FDA statistician at the time, suggested that 50,000 children be immunized in a controlled study, and she was overruled. And that's when they found that interception was a problem. So 900 to 1,000 patients for a lot of studies is okay. For HIV studies now, you're seeing 5,000, 10,000. 
huge numbers of patients. Requires two uh, registrational trials for licensure, usually. There are exceptions, but usually. And you have to file the results with the agency, whether positive or negative. And I have a rule of thumb that you've got to publish the results, whether positive or negative. So with my colleague, who now is at the uh, Medical University of South Carolina, we did what was, we thought was a cool study, and that was looking at interventions for West Nile virus with a hyperimmune globulin. And we found that we needed a universal IRB. You had a hospital on one side of the street, a hospital on the other side of the street. It was improved in one hospital and not the other, and they weren't going to transfer the patient across the street. And they weren't going to do, you know, remote access. So it was crazy. And then the FDA demands adequate numbers of volunteers to determine, determine safety. And we're going to come back to that again in a minute. So I want to give you an example of what I consider a really cool study. This was the shingles prevention study, double-blind placebo control. It was Yoka Merck VZV vaccine strain. It was sponsored jointly by Merck and the National Institutes of Health. Live attenuated vaccine, about 24,000 live viral particles in it. Um, the age of the subjects, there were 38,500 individuals who participated in this trial. 60 to 69, over 20,000, greater than 70, over 17,000, over 80, about 2,500. The three endpoints were burden of illness, post-herpetic neuralgia, and herpes zoster, incidence per thousand years. And I've already mentioned that. So here's what we call the burden of illness. So you record the worst pain score on any day since the onset of rash, and then you sum the area under the curve, and it's what we call the burden of illness. So, okay, we mentioned uh, the number of subjects. Greater than 95% of the subjects completed the study. So I guess these people are bored, they're retired, they needed something to do, so they were willing to come back. Suspected of having zoster, over 1,300. Uh, confirmed of ha has, as having zoster, um, about nine, about close to 1,000. It was evenly split in the two study populations. And then, because the randomization was two to one, by the way. And then the PCR confirmation was in the ballpark of 94%, culture 1%, clinical 5 to 6%. Okay, so here are the data. Burden of illness was reduced by 60%, post herpetic neuralgia by 66%, incidence of herpes zoster was cut in half, with relatively nice confidence intervals for each of those three endpoints. And it can be demonstrated in another way, too. This is simply a survival plot. Here are the placebo recipients. Here are the zoster vaccine recipients. <clears throat> the study was performed over a period of five years. This is the incidence of herpes zoster, and this is the incidence of post herpetic neuralgia. You learn something else from Kaplan-Meier survival data, and that is you notice that this rate is relatively constant for placebo recipients, whether it's post herpetic neuralgia <coughs> or the incidence of herpes zoster. And so there's no waning effect of the vaccine over this five-year period of time. I'll come back to that in a minute. This is a live attenuated vaccine. Okay, and if you look at how age influences outcome, you can see that the burden of illness score really is no different, different whether you're 60 to 69 or whether you're greater than 70. The incidence of post herpetic neuralgia certainly is no different in the two age groups. But if you look at the incidence of herpes zoster, herpes zoster was less, less efficacious in the elderly, where now efficacy was only in the ballpark of you know, 40% compared to the younger healthy individuals where the efficacy of the vaccine was higher. And as we follow these patients even further out, we see waning of efficacy, implying that the immunizations uh, the ACIP, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, will probably have to require a second dose of this vaccine uh, to boost immunity. Before they do, though, there's a second vaccine that's an inactivated vaccine that will be licensed probably in the next six months that's far more efficacious than this one. Okay, that study was monitored by a data safety and monitoring board. And the goal of the study is to guarantee the well-being of volunteers who participate in the trial. You do interim analyses for efficacy or undue toxicity. And there are a variety of methods you can use. The two that people like the most are Lambda Metz and O'Brien and Fleming. Um, and you monitor temporal changes in therapy to make sure the trial design remains contemporary and ethical. So the Data Safety and Monitoring Board for the Shingle study met about once a year for the five years of this study. 
and it came darn close to meeting the termination boundaries, uh, but didn't. Phase four, people don't talk about this, but the goal is verification of the phase three data, guarantee safety, and it's usually a few thousand patients. Now, where does the FDA really demand phase four data? When there is an expedited licensure, and they may have only seen the safety data on 1,000 patients, they want to see safety data on another 10,000 patients. And so the sponsoring company will be required to evaluate the additional 10,000 patients. Here's another reason to do it, too, and that is for people who are aficionados of clinical trials, the more you look at them, the more you study them, what you learn in a phase three study at an academic institution may not really be reproducible in the real world because physicians in the real world don't understand <laughs> what happened in the academic environment. So they're important. So okay. I, didn't, um, I actually designed and patients that are subject identified or is it more like that when somebody gets a drug then the physician just sends a form to FDA? Or well, what happens, no, what, happen, what happens with a phase four study is the pharmaceutical company has to rigorously collect the data, but they collect it in a different environment. They have community physicians who are providing them the data from real world experience. Okay, outcome, hopefully we improve the outcome of patient intervention. You don't want to do a clinical trial if you don't help somebody. Uh, you at least get further insight into the natural history of disease. And the results of a negative study, uh, as I mentioned, must be reported. But a negative study can still teach you a lot. And the example I'd use is we learned a lot from the West Nile virus study. We didn't show, you know, the immune blocking the product work, but we learned about the natural history of disease. We learned the predictors of outcome and who's going to be normal, who isn't going to be normal. And that will set up the next study. And Mike and I hope that we're going to get a small molecule out of our U19 grant that will be able to take into patients who have West Nile virus, and the lessons that we learned from the original study should be uh, uh, should help us tremendously. And if no, no benefit, there's integrity in the results. Okay, that's it. I was gonna I'm gonna quit there, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. See if there are any questions. Yeah, I'll look in the chat box. For now, any questions from the room here? What did I forget? Absolutely. You and I do this together. I mean, <laughs> Ed and David Kimberlin and I have been partners in this for what, 15 years? Well, since that wonderful day in 2003 at the ACAC meeting in San Diego or something. Yep. All started. Well, I was close. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, great. Thank you all for coming. Uh, next week we have our last lecture about Target, what makes it valid, what makes it drugable. Um, and I'm sure that Rich will be here for a few more minutes if you want to yeah. ask us yeah, yeah. a question. All right. Thank you all. Close this. Do you want to